I'm delighted that you come to see my house today. Well, you know, it seems like it was just yesterday that we finished building it, but it was back in 1892. <laughs> I do declare how time flies. Oh, oh good heavens, where all my man is. Well, here I am babbling away, and I haven't even introduced myself properly. I'm Mrs. Carrie Louise Smith Dudley. But you can call me Carrie. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Now, I came here from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to visit my Aunt Harriet Mills and her husband, Uncle Mills. They have a ranch not too far from here of about 300 acres. Maybe you heard of it. They're over on Telegraph and Mills Road. Well, the South wasn't a real cheerful place to be back then, so when Mr. Dudley proposed to me, well, I figured that I was just meant to stay on here in California. <laughs> now, some people say that I came to escape an unfortunate romantic entanglement. <laughs> but I know you don't listen to idle gossip now, do you? Now, where was I? Oh, I have this little book here. I wrote down some things because I wanted to be sure I don't forget anything about my house to tell you. So, um, let's see. Before I begin with the house, let me tell you about the current events here in um, 1892 in California. Now, Benjamin Harrison was our 23rd president, and California had been a state for 42 years. The county of Ventura, had six towns and a population of 5,000 people. And the town of Ventura had 3,000 people living here at the time. <laughs> Some of the new inventions were those days were the telephone and the telegraph. And of course, you know that we have two streets named after those inventions. Right about that time, Mr. Edison brought us the phonograph and electricity. <laughs> Oh, bicycles were well, all the rage among all ranks of society, and everyone wanted one of those new Kodak cameras. <laughs> oh, I remember when I read in my ladies magazine, The Delineator. Well, I read about this new invention they had that could hold two pieces of fabric together called a zipper. Can you imagine? Oh, well, when I read that, I just said to myself, what will they think of next? <laughs> now, we're going to go around this porch. We call it a wraparound porch. And I'm going to take you in the side entrance. This is a lovely wraparound porch. We call it because it wraps around from the front of the house all the way to the side. And as I mentioned, this is the side door where we take in our friends and family. Now, as you look around here, you notice all of our beautiful farmland. It didn't always look like this. When my husband Benjamin first came here in 1875, well, it was just covered with four feet high of wildflowers and mustard plants. That was back, as I said, in 1875. He bought the first 40 acres, and he paid $10 an acre for it. <laughs> well, Benjamin tamed the soil, and he planted wheat and barley and walnuts and lima beans. Oh, did you know that Ventura County is considered the capital of lima beans in the entire world? <laughs> yes, in fact, just in 1893, just a year after we built this house, the farmers of Ventura County were given an award at the Chicago World's Fair Exposition. And the award was for the best beans in the world. <laughs> well, back to my house now here. We hired a well-known architect by the name of Mr. Selwyn Shaw. Now, maybe you heard of him? He had already built the Bard Hospital over on Poli Street and the Methodist Church on Main Street, which, speaking of, I just heard a prediction the other day about the Methodist Church. They say that a hundred years from now, it's going to be used as a bed and breakfast hotel, and they're going to call it the Victorian Rose. <laughs> Now, Benjamin was a very forward-thinking man. 
You see those little wires up there on the porch ceiling? Well, Benjamin knew that electricity was coming soon to Ventura County, and so he had those wires put in so that we would be ready. He was fixing to be the first to have electricity in our house. <laughs> Oh, and did I mention that we have a telephone installed in our house, too? We were the first on Telegraph Road. Later today, you're going to meet my friend, Sherry. Now, she has this uncanny ability to see the future, and she's always making predictions for me. In fact, just the other day, she told me that my house is going to be significant in years to come because, well, first of all, generations of my family are going to live here. And secondly, it's going to be considered the last working farm within the city limits of Ventura. Let's go inside. Now, Benjamin paid cash for this house, so Mr. Shaw included this beautiful hand-carved fireplace. You'll notice that this beautiful detail of the wood carving on the fireplace matches the wood carving on the molding throughout the room. And, of course, the furniture matches. Now, it's all done in what we call the Eastlake style, named after Mr. Charles Eastlake, who was very popular and fashionable at the time. Of course, you know I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> oh, by the way, did you notice my dining table over here? This beautiful tablecloth has been in my family for generations. Now, let's see. Over here, we have a picture of Benjamin and his brother, Frank. Frank owns the land adjacent, and they came here to California together and bought the land together. Now, members of my family and Benjamin's together have been involved in all of the important wars of the United States, going back to Benjamin's grandfather in the Revolutionary War. And this is a portrait of my granddaddy, Captain John Smith. Now, he received his commission from President James Madison in the War of 18 and 12. Now, I hate to admit it, but Benjamin is a Yankee. Yes, and you know, he likes to say that he proved his patriotism when he joined the Union Army in 1864. In fact, he helped to find and capture our dear president, Mr. Jefferson Davis. <laughs> he boasts about that, but it's a fact that I don't really share with the folks back home. <laughs> I have to say that Benjamin probably wouldn't have been my choice for a suitor back in Dixie, but here in California, you know everything is different. But in spite of our differences, Benjamin and I have had a very happy marriage and a wonderful life together. We have four children, three girls and a boy. You'll hear more about that generation later on. Back home in Louisiana, well, we had lots of help in the house, so I really had to adjust to life here in California. Another thing I never really got used to was, well, Benjamin is a very strict tea totaler. Now back home, we used to enjoy a glass of port in the parlor or, you know, wine with dinner, but Benjamin won't hear of it. Now, my husband is what we call a gentleman farmer. His health is poor and so that restricts his physical activity on the farm, but it does give him more time for his community affairs in which he is very active. He became a Justice of the Peace in 1883, and he holds court right here in our parlor. Well, most of his cases involve thievery or livestock or trespassing, that sort of thing. Benjamin is also the president of the Anti-Saloon League. <laughs> He's known around these parts as the daddy of the high license. And that's because he was responsible for increasing the fees for a license to sell spirits from $64 a year to $600 a year. <laughs> 
Now this room has the only fireplace, so it gets nice and cozy in here. When we close these pocket doors, oh, the children love to be in here. And they do their homework right here on the table when Benjamin isn't conducting business. Now we're going to go through these pocket doors, and I'd like to invite you to step into my parlor. Well, this is my parlor where my family relaxes and entertains after a hard day's work and doing their farm chores. As you look around the room, you can see some of our favorite pastimes and games. We play checkers and chess and card games like hearts and whist. And uh, I want to show you this game over here. It's called Crokinole. Now, it's a game that you play with your fingers and these little wooden things kind of like a shuffleboard with your finger. Let's see if I can do that. There we go. Now, it has rules, the game of Crokinole, but the first rule is there are no rules. Now, something else I want to show you here that's very interesting is this very highly advanced gadget. It's called a stereoscope. So what you do is you hold it up to your face like this, and then you move this around to your vision. Now, right now, there's nothing to look at, right? But I want to show you, we have a whole collection of these cards, and they have pictures on them from all over the world. This one is the Egyptian Pyramids and Sphinx. You notice that there's two pictures there, right? So now I'm going to put it into the stereoscope, this very highly advanced technological device. And then, whoopsie, I'm going to hold it and move it to my vision here. And those two pictures are going to become, oh my goodness, one three-dimensional picture. Oh, it is just so amazing. I tell you, the children, they love this. And it's very educational for them, too, because they learn about all these different places from all over the world. Now, by looking around this room, you can see that music is very important to our family. So we've got over here a phonograph. And this is Dooley's saxophone. Now, Dooley's my son, Oscar, but we call him Dooley. And here's our family organ. And then this piece of furniture over here is, its sole purpose is to house all of our sheet music. And you can see, we really enjoy music together as a family. In fact, one of my daughters, uh, Mary, she's going to be a music teacher when she grows up. Speaking of music, there's a neighbor family, the Knox family. Everybody in that family plays an instrument. Now, when there's a party or something in the neighborhood or around town or even as far away as uh, Santa Paula, they hear about it, they pack up all their instruments into their buckboard wagon, and they head on over. I tell you, the party doesn't start until the Knox family gets there. Now, I mention this family because there's a little girl in the family. Her name is Miriam, and she has a big, big crush on my son, Oscar, who we call Dooley. Of course, Dooley doesn't even know that she exists right now, but that's going to change in the future, and I'll tell you about that later on. Now, I want to show you some of the pictures that we have hanging up here in our, our parlor. Over here, oh, well, these are a couple of portraits of Benjamin and me. Now, <laughs> You'll notice that the photographer caught me on a bad day. Don't look at my face, I forgot to smile. You will notice, too, that the pictures are hanging from ropes, from a piece of molding that we call picture rail. And that way we don't have to put holes in our plaster walls. Now, over here, on this other wall here, on either side of the window, we have pictures of my sister-in-law, Mary, and Frank, who is Benjamin's brother. As I said before, they own the land next door, so they're our neighbors and our relatives. She's real nice. We do lots of things together. 
Now, before we leave this room, there is one other thing I do want to point out to you, and that's underneath this little sofa here that we call a settee. Can you see that little mouse trap back there? Well, it's actually fake. Someone in this family is a prankster, and she put it there to scare her lady friends when they came over for a club meeting one day. You'll meet her later on. Well, let's go across the hall to the next room on the tour. Well, in this room, we're moving ahead in time a little bit. I was just looking at this picture here. Now, this used to be an open porch, open to the outside. We closed it in in 1903 when my mama came to stay with us. We made it into a little bedroom for her. Oh, she was put out because her house had been destroyed by the Union soldiers. So you can see in this picture here what the house looked like when it was an open porch. And here's my mama over here in the black. Her name was Caroline, too. Right over here, before that, this was all closed in. And this was the outside wall to the house. Well, this may seem a bit improper now, but you are standing now in the master bedroom, which I shared with my husband for many years before he passed on and we passed it to my son Dooley when he got married. Oh, by the way, this quilt on the bed is another one of my many heirlooms from my family. Remember I told you about the Knox family and the little girl who had the crush on him? Well, they grew up together. Her name was Miriam. And, oh, of course, Dooley was terrorizing her, as boys will do to girls, chasing her with snakes and teasing her and pulling her hair. But <laughs> she, of course, still had that crush on him. And she called him her secret sorrow during those years because, of course, he had no idea how much she cared for him. Well, after high school, Miriam went away to Los Angeles to a boarding school to become an actress. Well, she had become quite lovely by then, and she had a number of bows. In fact, one of them had actually proposed to her, and she accepted. Well, here's a picture of her with one of her bows now in the automobile here. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but he, that was in Santa Barbara, and he was visiting his aunt there. He was the heir to the Duke family fortune. Dooley, he wanted to go away to college too, but when Benjamin took ill, Dooley had to stay home and take care of the farm, being the only boy. This is a picture of him during that time with one of his friends. Well, with Miriam gone, Dooley, he realized how much he missed her and loved her. So he sat down and he wrote her a letter asked her to come home and marry him. <laughs> Miriam was shocked, of course, having no idea that he had feelings for her. So she broke off her engagement and she came home to Ventura to marry my Dooley. Benjamin passed on in 1913 and Miriam and Dooley married in 1915. So I gave them this bedroom and I moved to the back bedroom. And then they used this open porch, which was closed in. They opened up this wall the way it is today, and they used it for a nursery for their babies. Now, my fortune-telling friend tells me that Dooley is going to live in this house all of his life for 83 years. My daughters went to college, too. Alice went to Pomona College, and um, she studied philosophy, of all things, and realized when she came home that she needed something a little bit more practical. Well, Miriam loved to drive, so she drove her all the way to Santa Barbara to take business classes. While she was there, Miriam decided that she would enroll in a class in professional tailoring. And we have her sewing machine over here. 
Uh, as you can see, she's got all her implements left out. She's not exactly a neat worker. And this is her mannequin that she uses along with the skirt that she's working on now. Her skills came in real handy during the Depression years because she earned herself a few extra dollars making some nice, fine, fancy clothes for her clients. So before we leave this room, I have to show you some really lovely pictures of Miriam through the years. Now this one over here is a picture of her in the 1920s. Oh, notice that short skirt. Well, I never would myself, but <laughs> that's her. And this is one of my favorites, Miriam on the beach with her children when they were little. Now this piece of artwork over here is really very lovely. It was done by an artist called Rosamund. She found this photograph that was taken of Miriam over on the beach in Santa Cruz Island. And she took that little photograph here that you see in the corner and she made it into a beautiful watercolor painting. And so we have that here today framed. Now, I'm going to walk through this secret passageway into the back bedroom. The children used to love to go in there and play and they would hide from their cousins. <laughs> now today we have some vintage clothing for you to look at as you pass through. So I'll go through first and then I'll meet you on the other side in the back bedroom. Well, this back bedroom was originally the girls' room, and I used to meet here with the corseteer from the Spencer Corset Company. She came once a year to measure me for my custom-made corset. Now, in my younger days, after she finished measuring me, I'd say, now make it four inches shorter. <laughs> well, I've given up my vanity now for comfort. I don't do that anymore. Now, oh my goodness, <gasps> oh, don't look at this. I can't understand why the, my undergarments were left here on this bed. Come over here and look, look at this vanity here. This is where the girls have their implements where as they grew up and went to dances and parties. Well, they would want to make themselves beautiful. So they would use these implements. You can see there's a curling iron over here. You put your hair in it. And of course, my hair has plenty of natural curl. I don't need that. This thing over here is a glove stretcher. You see, you put the fingers of the glove in there and it stretches them out very nicely. Just in case your hands get sweaty when you're dancing. And then we have some button hooks and of course, hat pins. A lady must have her hat pin at all times. Now, I wanted to show you, this. oh, here's a picture of my youngest daughter, Eki. Her name was Ethel. We nicknamed her Eki. She married Miriam's brother, but unfortunately, she died young. It broke my heart to lose my daughter, but her little girl, Alice, did come to live with me here in this back bedroom. So this is Alice's bed. She's got some of her books over here and her toys. And this little doll bed here with the dolls on it, well, that was her mother, Ethel's. We made it for her, and then she passed it down to Alice. And then I think Alice, hopefully, when she grows up, will have children and pass it on to her children and her grandchildren. Now, other things in this room here, we have Alice's little dresses from when she was five years old. That was in 1928. And this is another of all my favorite pictures little Alice with her curls and her kitty cat. And of course, that's me. And then where is my delineator? This is what keeps me current in fashions. Here it is. This is my Delinea Lady, Ladies Magazine. And you can see it's quite thick. This is one from uh, in 1901. It's an old one hanging around here. But look, it's got colored fashion plates all the way from Paris. Very important out here in the sticks of California to stay connected that way. Now, I think the next thing we're going to do is go into the most remodeled room of the house. Well, back in 1892, when we first built the house, this room was a pantry. 
but that changed in 1903. Remember I told you that Benjamin liked all the latest improvements in technology. So in 1903, we got indoor plumbing. Now, before that, we had a nice big old tub that we'd bring into the kitchen, and every Saturday we'd fill it up and you'd get a bath whether you needed it or not. And of course, we had chamber pots in the, all of the bedrooms. Now, if you look through this curtain over here to the window to the outside, you'll see our outhouse. So we had that too before we had indoor plumbing. Now, when you go outside and you look through that moon window in the outhouse, you'll see that it's a two-seater. Benjamin's idea, not mine. <laughs> As I mentioned, this room was always being remodeled with the latest of technology. Although the sink here is the original, so is the tub. Now, this toilet is definitely an update, as you can see. Now back to this clawfoot tub. As I said, it's original. Can you see this little chip over here? Well, that happened in 1933 when Dooley's shave cup fell off the shelf and hit it right here. Now that's a pretty big ship for a little cup like that, but that's what happened. And believe it or not, that's the only damage to the entire house from that earthquake. Now, are you ready to go into the kitchen? Well, here we are in the kitchen of my house, which is really the hub of the house. As I mentioned before, when I first came here, I had to get used to doing everything myself. I had to learn a lot when I first married Benjamin. <laughs> After a while, I did learn how to cook without burning everything, and. I became a very good housekeeper and a pretty good cook, if I do say so myself. Of course, in the southern fashion, that is. <laughs> well, on the tables here in the kitchen, you see the implements of our daily cooking. They're here for you to explore and uh, examine on your own. I did eventually get help in the way of a woman who came to live with us in the house. And you'll hear more about her when you go upstairs. Now, just about everything that we eat here comes from the farm. We have cows for our milk and our butter, and we have chicken for our eggs. Oh, and I have a wonderful little vegetable garden outside the kitchen door here that has lettuce and tomatoes and string beans and squash and, of course, Lima beans. <laughs> After Miriam moved in, well, she was fine with me still being in charge of the kitchen. Now we've lived together in this house for many years and we get along real well. Now being from the South, I like to cook fresh biscuits and gravy for my family every day. And my biscuits are melt in your mouth. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, look, I was fixing to bake a pie for your visit and I plum forgot the time got away from me. Oh well, so you can see why I need help in this big house, can't you? <laughs> this room over here <laughs> is our pantry. Now if you look inside, you can see those ventilated shelves. They keep things nice and cool like our milk and our butter. And of course, I do all my own canning. This room also serves as our laundry room with all of the tools of laundering ready for us to go to work. Now remember I told you that Benjamin was a very forward-thinking man and he always had to have all the latest inventions so we were the first on Telegraph Road to get a telephone. Well, after the 1906 earthquake, oh, everybody wanted to come over and use it to find out how their friends and relatives throughout the state were. So, in those days, it was a party line. Oh, oh. Yeah, you can still hear people talking. You want to take a listen? Hello, Mrs. Sexton, Mrs. Dudley here. Oh, Carrie, how nice of you to call. I was so sorry you missed President Roosevelt's visit yesterday. Is Nathan feeling better? Oh, yes, thank you, much better. But I just couldn't leave him alone yesterday. Tell me all about it. Well, as you know, the flower decorations were much <laughs> as they were... 
Well, from here, I'm going to walk through the hallway with you on your way up the stairs before you meet Miriam. So over here in the hallway, we have the crib that my babies used and my grandbabies used. So it's been in our family and hopefully it'll stay and have another couple of generations in it too. Now you see this shadow box here? <laughs> Nowadays you people call it something about artifacts, but it's just a bunch of junk that the kids left hanging around. Uh, and you see this silver flask here? Well, I told you that Benjamin's a teetotaler, so don't ask me how that got in there. <laughs> Come around here and I'll show you the bookcase. This bookcase has encyclopedias from the year 1892. The year that the house was built, we bought brand new encyclopedias for the children. And they have everything in there from A to Z. We also have a wonderful collection of volumes of poetry. So that concludes my part of the tour. I hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I did and I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. Now from here, I'm going to turn you over to Miriam, my daughter-in-law, and she's going to tell you about the next generations to come and she's going to show you the upstairs of our house. And don't forget, I invited my friend Sherry too. You know that person who can see into the future and she's going to tell you about what they call the restoration, which comes way after my time. So thanks for coming and again, please to make your acquaintance. Hello, and welcome once again to our home. My name is Miriam Knox Dudley, and I came to the Little Bit of Dudley House in 1915 when I married Oscar Dooley Dudley. As Mother Dudley told you, I had a crush on him when we were children, as I grew up right across the way at the neighboring farm. I didn't think he cared for me much, though. He was always teasing me so. But one day, when I was away at school, I got a letter, and he was asking me to come home and marry him. I was thrilled. So the rest, as they say, is history. Why don't you join me upstairs? Oh, but please do mind this low ceiling. Or you could just take my children's favorite route down the stairs and slide down the banister. No worries about hitting your head if you do that. This shadow box is really neat because it displays the hammer that they used to dedicate the bridge that went across the Santa Clara River. This was very important because so many people died trying to get across this area. So it was a very big service project for Benjamin Dudley to do and he completed it in 1898. Welcome to our landing. This was such a beautiful area to read our books and to listen to music. Because you know, to be an official Dudley, you had to love books, you had to love music, and you had to love cats. We had all of that in spades. Here's a look at our landing library. And then we have a radio back here where we could listen to music. On this side, oh, please, do, do not mind my mess. <laughs> if I knew you were coming, I would have tied it up a little bit better. Those boys, those Dudley brothers, they had a market downtown Ventura, the Dudley Brothers Market, where as you can see here it says, everything for the table. That was their business. Sometimes they would do some of their paperwork here and they don't always tidy up after themselves. If you come this way, why don't we take a look at my son Levitt's room. My Levitt was born just a year after we were married in 1916. He was a very busy little boy always playing baseball, soccer, marbles, fishing, roller skating, doing all kinds of things that little boys love to do. He also enjoyed reading, just like I said, all Dudleys had to. This, in fact, one of his favorite books, Treasure Island. He also loved Huck Finn, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, and a series called Our Wonder World. Even though he had all of those hobbies and interests, his main interest and his passion, what he was best at was art and model making. He made this model up here of a plane. It won a blue ribbon at the county fair. 
but his father and I knew he was destined for much bigger things than just the county fair. We weren't at all surprised when he went off to art school in Los Angeles. While he was at art school, he got a part-time job at Paramount Studios as a set designer. He did some marvelous work. After that, he did some freelance artwork for Better Homes and Gardens magazine, Sunset magazine, and the LA Times. He also did some architectural renderings, which were always very fabulous. He designed many things that you might have seen before and was just a spectacular artist. Sometimes his work would let him travel to different places and he took that opportunity to write some travel articles for newspapers. Now why don't we take a look at my daughter Johanna's room. My daughter Johanna was a very bright young girl. She loved to read. It was her ultimate passion. And she got her first library card in 1926. She was just a small child then, being Levitt's younger sister. She liked to reward herself for good behavior by pasting stars to the ceiling. And as you can say, if she does say so herself, she was a quite well-behaved child. While you're looking at the ceiling, please notice this beautiful light fixture that's original to the house. Don't you think it was very forward thinking of my father-in-law to have made this house ready for electricity before we even had it? I think so. <laughs> oh, Johanna. <laughs> she had so many nice clothes, midi blouses, wool skirts, dressy clothes, party clothes. She even had a pair of Mary Janes but she was most comfortable in her overalls because in those, she could climb trees, ride her horse Zuzu, and play with her cats. Nebuchadnezzar was her favorite. She loved to read in the crook of a tree outside. That was her favorite spot. <laughs> One day, she even wore her pajamas to school. She was promptly sent home by the principal, of course, but I have to admit, I was a little flattered because I made those pajamas myself and she thought they were nice enough to wear to school. Well, my Johanna, she really wasn't one that was too fond of dolls or other girly things to be exact, but she did have another funny story I'd like to share with you about Mr. Raggedy Andy here. One day, she accidentally dropped him into her chamber pot, but she said, mother, it was of no mind, it was raining that day. So I simply opened the window, put him on the roof, and he was washed clean. Oh, that child. And if you let me be so candid, I do have one more story about this uh, infamous chamber pot. Her brother used to open the window and water the flower bed instead of using his chamber pot. And I caught her saying to him one day how jealous that made her. Oh, my children. <laughs> when Johanna went away to college, this room was taken over by little Alice, her cousin. She moved into Johanna's room from Grandma Dudley's room downstairs. She used to like to listen to this radio here, and she would listen to a big band that was broadcast all the way from Catalina Island. After she went to college, she was the personal assistant to radio personality Al Jarvis. And then she worked during World War II as a hostess at the Hollywood Canteen where she met lots of stars. What an exciting life she created for herself. Why don't we go on to the last room upstairs and I'll show you around in there. So this room was occupied by a wonderful woman that I hired to be my mother's helper. Her name was Amanda Nelson and that's really about all we know about her except that she was a mixed race lady and she had an illness when she was younger that caused all of her hair to fall out. So she was always wearing a little cap like this one and the one that you see of her in the photo. She was so wonderful with the children and she helped me a lot with the chores around this house and that's how she earned her room and board. She also made the most delicious cornbread muffins, gave the best back rubs and was beloved by all of us in the Dudley family. Now this door behind me leads up to the attic. 
This was a great room to dry clothes when, the, when it was rainy outside, a great place for the children to play where it was nice and dry, and the children liked to go up there even if it wasn't raining because Grandma Dudley had a trunk of long dresses and hats up there which made for the perfect dress-up game. So I have to tell you, when the children were small, I would sneak up there before they came in and I would set the rocking chair into motion so it looked like someone had just been there. And as they came up the steps, I said, oh good, the ghost just left. And that was our play game. I have one more little confession before I leave you here today. You know the, the mouse trap under the love seat downstairs that Mother Dudley told you somebody put under there? as a prank, well, that was me. But let's keep that between you and I. Thank you so much for coming to see our house today, and I hope you had as wonderful of time as I did. Bye-bye till next time. Hey, I'm Sherry Oschlager, and I am the original founding president and current president of San Buenaventura Heritage. 42 years ago, we were part of a neighborhood group, my husband and I. We petitioned city council to save this house and to actually have a historic park. We were one vote shy from having the whole 10 acres. The compromise that the city council reached was the Dudley family donating the house and moving it to this upper corner of their property and the developer donating the three quarters of an acre here. When Prop 13 came along, the city didn't do it in their budget, so they gave us a chance to do all the restoration ourselves. We've had many volunteers, in fact, we're all volunteers still, engineers, architects, all donated their time, actresses, actors, a little of everybody in the community. And we love the project. <laughs> and as you see from the restoration, we did the lath and plaster. We didn't do the quick way of doing wallboard. The, all the brown that you see was painted white for many generations. We researched. We had a local historian that taught us how to swirl and figure out the layers of paint over the years, and we went back to the original color. One of our super volunteers was Miriam Knox Dudley. She would leave little notes at my house saying how she really wanted to save the house. It was really neat when we were appealing to city council. One of our early volunteers, Amy Bolland, who was a sculptress, had Miriam sit still and she did this bust of Miriam Knox Dudley, and she entered it in County Fair and won awards. It's really neat to have it part of the house. And a lot of the furniture that you see is Dudley family furniture, donated by the family later on. And we really need everybody's help. There's still more work to be done, and with your help, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs>